Uh, my name is Jim Horman, and we're going to talk about the biology of soil compaction. We've got a few problems here this morning, but uh, I understand this may go off at uh, noon, so I'm going to speed it up just a little bit. You know, when we talk about ideal soil composition, uh, roughly 50% of the, the soil is what we call solid material. About 45% of that is the mineral portion, and in an ideal soil, we have about 5% organic matter. A lot of farmers don't know this, but uh, as much as 50% of the soil can actually be pore space. However, when we compact the soil, uh, a lot of times we don't have that much. So let's take a look at a compacted soil, look at some different bulk densities. If you look at an uncultivated, undisturbed woodlot, typically the bulk density is anywhere from 1 to 1.2 grams per uh, a centimeter cubed. And, and what we're looking at is we're looking at the weight uh, uh, and basically the weight over a volume of, of soil. And so that would be ideal. If we had 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed, that would be an ideal soil. We have about 50% uh, pore space in that. But as we get into cultivated clays and cultivated sandy loams, you'll notice that the bulk density increases, and that means we have less room for air and water to move. And so if you look on my right-hand side there at the bottom, once we reach a bulk density of 1.6 grams per uh, centimeter cubed, it starts to become root limiting. That's somewhere around 250 pounds per square inch. We get up to 1.8 and then the roots are totally restricted and you can't, you, uh, the roots can't get through there. So that's real important on a lot of our soils. We're actually uh, limiting the roots and how deep they can go. So let's take a look at, at what is typical in our soils. We generally talk about the plow layer, and this may be anywhere from 7 to 8 to 9 inches deep. And you'll notice that we have, as we, lighten, as we um, plow that soil, uh, the bulk density goes down. It's like around 1.4. And then we reach this limiting layer there, about seven, eight, nine inches deep, where it's very hard for the roots to get through the soil. We've seen this in almost all the soils that we've, we've looked at. Uh, there's a, a limiting layer there, and a lot of times, especially on corn roots, they'll go off at a right-hand angle, also on soybeans. So what we're doing with the cover crops and the no-till is we're trying to break up these compaction zones. The very fine roots can get through uh, planes of weakness, and they can uh, decrease that bulk density so that uh, uh, our main crop, the green crops, can uh, get deeper into the soil to get moisture and also nutrients. Soil organic matter, if you look at some of the characteristics, why we want to increase the soil organic matter contact, look at the bulk density of soil organic matter. It's about 0.6 compared to, say, 1.45, somewhere in that range for where we have uh, a tilled soil. So soil organic matter has less density in the soil has more room and have more space for air and water storage. And here's an important characteristic. Every pound of soil organic matter can hold 18 to 20 pounds of water. That's why we like to say that soil organic matter acts like a sponge. And here's a, a, a picture of that. You can see the little black areas in there. Uh, if you look at soil organic matter, uh, it's, it's not nearly as dense. The color tends to be uh, light to dark brown, and it has room to store water and also to store uh, nutrients. You also notice that the surface area is, is quite large, so that allows uh, water to get trapped uh, in between those particles. It also gives structure to our soils. When we looked at a compacted soil, uh, the density could be between 1.6 to 1.8. Compacted soils kind of have, have a much higher density, less room for uh, air and water storage. They tend to act like roads or road pavement. They a lot of times result in flash floods. It was interesting this year. We had a drought. We had a, a couple of one-inch rains, but the majority of that water ran off the soil surface, even though the soil was extremely dry. It's because we turned that soil into road pavement. I like to say we turn it in whenever you do excessively till the soil, you turn it into a road pavement. We've all probably seen a farmer, maybe your neighbor, really till the soil. What happens when they till it and get it very fine? As soon as it rains, it turns into concrete. And so dense soils also have less microbial life, and that's really important for nutrient management. Here's an electron uh, microscope of some of the clay minerals. This is where the, the water and the nutrients can be trapped. Generally, um, this clay mineral will put an organic film around
around there and the nutrients get trapped in between the soil organic matter and, and the minerals that are in the soil. Three, soil compaction factors. We all know that heavy equipment, uh, due to its weight, will compact the soil. But did you know that rain and gravity will also compact the soil? We can have rainfall, uh, when it comes down, it can reach a terminal velocity of 35 miles per hour. It almost looks like a mini uh, nuclear explosion when it goes off. So that can move soil and water, but it also tends to have a compacting factor. Is there a visual way to measure soil compaction? And actually, you can go on your farm, and you can probably see this. Uh, if you look at a fence row and look at the elevation difference between your field and where that fence row is. We've measured this in Ohio. Some said that this was due to wind. Others said that uh, uh, a lot of the soil had eroded and, and uh, had piled up in a uh, wind row. But actually, we've measured this on the lee side of a uh, uh, woods. And we saw anywhere from a 6 to 9 inch elevation difference. If 50% of that is void space, that equals an additional 3 to 4 and a half inches of additional water that we could store uh, in that soil. If you really want to see this, if you've got a, a wooded area, you can see the difference here in northwest Ohio. Uh, a lot of times the woods, is, uh, the woods that we had were actually uh, very low, and uh, that's where the water stood. Now often the water is standing on the headlands, uh, and we can see water standing there. It's because that soil is much more compacted. Here's the water available. Uh, the available water capacity of soil organic matter. That first inch of additional soil organic matter can gain you anywhere from one to almost two inches of additional water. If we get it up to five inches or five percent soil organic matter, you can see we're gaining on a sandy soil 2.5, on a silty loam four inches, and on a silty clay loam three inches of additional water. So uh, it starts off at one to two inches of water per foot of soil, and after we get up to about 5% organic matter, we're down to about a half to 0.8 uh, inches of additional water for, for every 1% organic matter that we're adding to that soil. This is extremely important in dry weather or in climates that don't have uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, rainfall. Here's what happens. We've talked about this, and where we've got a compacted or tilled soil, it tends to set up like the road, where we have good vegetation throughout the, the year, we increase that pore space so it slows down the water runoff and it increases water infiltration. Here's what happens if we speed up or double the velocity of water. The relationship is 2 to the 6th power for every time you double the velocity of water. This tells you how many more nutrients that that water can carry. The faster the water flows, the more energy it has. So if I go from one to two mile per hour, I can carry 64 times more nutrients. If I get up to 16 to 32 mile per hour in a flowing stream, I can carry a thousand times more nutrients with that water. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to slow the water down so that it drops its load, keeps the nutrients in the soil rather than running off. We have a lot of problems with hypoxia and eutrophication. Hypoxia is too much nitrogen and phosphorus getting into uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Eutrophication is mainly where we've got too much phosphorus causing a lot of uh, algae blooms. For water uptake, if you're looking at where the roots absorb most of the uh, water, it's in that top half. If you look at each one of these lines, it's about six inches. So 40% of the water uh, by that plant is absorbed within the top six inches. The next six inches will absorb about 30%. So 70% of the, of the water is absorbed in the top foot. This kind of explains why corn can actually do quite well with maybe only eight to nine inches of rooting depth before the roots start going off a right hand angle. It actually has almost 70% of the water. But if we can get those roots to go a little bit deeper, especially in a dry year, we can gain another 20 to, to as much as 30% more water as we get into that subsoil. Same thing goes for nutrient extraction, exact same relationship, 40, 30, 20, and 10, and you can see the depths there. So same relationship. Also, when we look at a soil, there's a big difference between 
no-till with the cover crop where we have live plants, notice the temperature difference. It's about 87 to 85 degrees. Over here where we have conventional, and maybe we have started to try to do no-till, you'll see that there's at least a 20 to maybe as much as a 30 uh, degree increase in the temperatures. This year, when we had a drought here in Ohio, we measure soil temperatures up around 130 to as high as 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And what impact does that have? Notice here the soil bacteria start to die at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. We get our best moisture somewhere where the soil is around 70 to 95 degrees. Once it gets over 95, notice we're only using at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 15% of the moisture is used for growth. 85% of the moisture is lost through evaporation and transpiration. So if we can keep that soil covered with live plants and keep a nice layer of residue on there, we can conserve moisture. And that's the key thing that I wanted to talk to you about. Also, for hot, dry summers, how much more water do we need when the temperature goes up? At 75 degrees Fahrenheit, we need about one inch of water per week. Raise that by 10 degrees, we need two inches. Raise that by another 10 inches, and now we're up to four inches of water a week. So your water requirements double for every 10 degree increase in temperature. Heat and drought together, they're linked together. They quickly increase yield losses in your soil. This information came from Dr. Elwin Taylor out of uh, Iowa. If we look at the soil and look what's going on, when we do subsoil tillage, where we add an extremely large amount of oxygen into the soil. It acts like a furnace, almost like a, a wood stove, you might say. Adding oxygen to the soil actually causes the soil organic matter to go up into the atmosphere. So we start to lose soil organic matters. And the more aggressive your tillage, the more soil organic matter losses you're having. Matter of fact, in the last uh, 50, 25 years, once tillage starts, you'll see that you will lose uh, as much as 50% organic matter. In some places, we've seen as much as 60% losses in soil organic matter. Notice, though, that once we started doing permanent sod and adding, uh, we can start to add organic matter back to that soil. But you notice that we didn't reach the same level. You might want to think about that. Why didn't we get back up to where we were? And the answer to that is quite simple. It has to do with the amount of roots and how tall we let that grass grow. We tend to, on our permanent sods, we'll cut off uh, the, the top growth. Top growth is related to root growth. The more root growth you have, the more healthy that plant is, the more organic matter you're going to add to your soil. Matter of fact, most of the organic matter in the soil comes from the roots. As much as 65 to 70 percent of the organic matter comes from roots. So the more roots we get into the soil, the higher our soil organic matter levels. Let's talk a little bit about compaction. Here's the typical tire. And you notice as you're putting weight on that soil, the forces are down. And then what actually happens is the soil uh, moves to the side and will actually get uh, kind of a lip there around that rut. You'll see that the soil is actually forced uh, upward. And so what happens then, if we take, say, a disc and we try to take that lip off and we try to fill in that hole, you always notice when, when this happens that you never quite fill it in. And why is that? Because we're losing the void space. When you break up the soil and you lose all your soil structure, you have less room for air and water. And so what we're doing is we're breaking the soil down and the mineral portion uh, is very solid, very dense. And so what we need to do is now lift it up uh, and keep it in shape. We need to have better soil structure. And one of the ways we can do that is with a root. You might see this root here. It's expanding the soil. Where that uh, man is pointing, you'll notice that when this big oil seed radish, these can get as big as your leg and get anywhere from three to four feet deep in the soil, although mostly the tuber is at the soil surface. But what it does is as it goes down, and it expands, it's forcing the soil down, forcing it to the side, and it's physically lifting it. And so what roots actually do is they actually compact the soil, but they reorientate uh, re the uh, clay particles, and then what they do is they form aggregates. So we're going to take some of the polysaccharides and the exudates that come from these roots, and we're going to form 
uh, nice aggregates which will um, give us some structure back to our soil so that our soil doesn't collapse on us and it's not quite as dense. Here's what the bacteria do. 90% of the bacteria are linked to the clay. Uh, 40 to 60% of the soil microbial biomass is associated with this clay and that's how we form something called a, a microaggregate. And what we do is we take these microaggregates, which are less than 250 microns, and we're going to form macroaggregates. Now, if you want to know what a macroaggregate looks like, when you go home, just take your shovel in your lawn, dig up some soil uh, in your lawn, and then shake uh, the, the, the turf a little bit, and you'll see these, what I'd say, pea-sized, small pieces, almost the size of a small piece of gravel, little pads. Those are the macroaggregates that are forming. So what we're doing is we're allowing that soil to start to set up so it has more structure, so it has more room for air and water. And, and by, that, by doing that, we can store more uh, air and water in that soil, and it, it's less dense. And one of the key uh, uh, fungus that we have in the soil are these mycorrhizal fungus. They actually infect 80% uh, percent of our plants. And they give off something called uh, glomalin or glomulin, some people call it. That's what gives us some of the uh, glycoproteins and, and some of the, it's a structure that helps to cement soil together to form these uh, macroaggregates. And here's what mycorrhizal fungus look like. You'll notice on the top we have this brown uh, root. The, um, the fungus are actually either white or yellow. And in a handful of soil, we can have as much as 20 to 25 miles of these filaments going into the soil. What these fungus do is they bring back water, nitrogen, and phosphorus to the plant. In exchange, the plant is going to feed that mycorrhizae of some of its uh, carbohydrates. As much as 25 to 40 percent of the total carbohydrate reserves in the root go to feed these fungus if they're available. It's a very beneficial relationship. And then when these fungus die, they give off uh, the, this glomulin that's inside their cell structure. It's kind of sticky. It's kind of like a glue. That helps to glue our soils together. So we want to keep these mycorrhizae healthy. They need to have live plants year-round in order to do that. Tillage and excess fertilizer tend to kill off the mycorrhizal fungus. And here's what happens. This shows that sticky substance being surrounded. It surrounds uh, the soil particles, and that's what gives us those nice macro aggregates that we were talking about. Building soil structures like building a house, uh, it starts with Mother Nature. We've, our carpenter is our plants, and we're going to start with this sand, silt, and clay. The roots are kind of like how we would frame up a house. Uh, some of the nails and the lag screws, uh, this humus is very hard, very tough. It's been around for hundreds, thousands of years. Uh, it's been broken down, so it sticks around. But what we're really uh, lacking in the soil is some of that glomalin or some of that active carbon. Some of the polysaccharides are missing. The nitrogen and the sulfur also act like braces. And then that surface residue, that's kind of like the roof on your house. So here's a picture of a house. And see how we start, let's take a look at how we build this out. We start off with the foundation, we add the wood. And so look around the room where you're, maybe you're sitting at. Notice that there's a lot of space in, in a building like this or in a house. The reason we have that is because the wood or the soil organic matter in the soil is giving structure and the nitrogen and the sulfur are acting like braces. And now we've got room for air and water to move. The light screws, I'd like to say, is how... Uh, soil organic matter attaches to the clay particles, and a lot of times we'll have phosphorus, we'll have some other uh, nutrients in between there that will give, uh, that will attach that clay particle and that organic matter together. The humus, again, is like nails, and then this glomulin kind of acts like uh, the glue or house wrap. It helps to insulate this house, and then the roof uh, is, is uh, uh, helps to keep, on a roof on a house, will help to keep out water. But what's interesting, in the soil, the roof actually acts to help keep out too much oxygen. Imagine what would happen if we had a tornado come through on your house and every other year took your roof off. We'd get too much water in there, and that water would start to rot out uh, the, the wood, and pretty soon this whole house would cave in. In the soil, if 
we get rid of the residue, we get too much oxygen into the soil, and it burns up the soil organic matter, and the whole house starts to compact and starts to decay, and everything falls in. It works the exact same way uh, in the soil. Too much oxygen, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide are um, uh, opposed to each other. When one increases, the other decreases. So carbon dioxide is heavier than the uh, oxygen, so they're inversely related. So if we get a heavy rain where we have a microaggregate, you're not going to get as much water infiltration, and a lot of the water will run off. One of the things that uh, farmers have uh, talked to me about is saying, you know, I've been in no-till for five or ten years, and some farmers will say that my soils are cold and wet. Other farmers who have been in no-till will say, my soils are warm and moist. So which one is right? Well, actually, let's take a look at this. Probably when you started into no-till, did you get rid of all the soil compaction? And so that's probably one of the reasons why our soils are cold. Compacted soils hold more moisture. So coming out of the winter, we're going to have water which holds the cold. It holds the cold and the heat. And so your soils will tend to be wet, and they'll also tend to be cold. As you start to get into no-till and you start to break up that soil and get more macropores to get the water to drain from your soils, that soil will start to warm up quicker. Matter of fact, you've probably seen this in your own home. Window panes a lot of times are triple. Uh, double or triple, and they use air as an insulation. So now when you start going, let's say you've been in no-till for one to two years, you're starting to get more residue at the surface. What is the color of residue when it breaks down? It actually turns black, and does black surfaces warm up the soil, or do they cause it to get colder? They tend to draw heat, and so they'll actually help to warm up the soil. So as we get more residue on top of the soil, your soils will start to warm up. And then, as you get a thick layer of residue, a lot of farmers think that this is not a good thing, but it actually is. What happens is, think about a compost pile. If I have one to two inches of residue on my soil surface, what happens in the middle of that compost pile? There's biological activity, and that will actually warm up the soil. Most farmers who are doing no-till with cover crops are fighting to keep residue. They have so much microbial activity and so many earthworms, they're actually fighting to keep the residue rather than trying to break it up. If you're having a hard time with residue, if it's causing problems to your tires, uh, we see a lot of that here in Ohio, chances are that you don't have a lot of microbial activity or a lot of earthworms in your soil, and you need to make, get your soil more healthy. Here's where we're measuring soil compaction. We can actually do this uh, in the field, and we're finding out that right next to that root, uh, the soil compaction levels uh, decrease by as much as 30%. Why do our soils compact? Well, look at your crop rotation. Typically, we, uh, at least here in Ohio, we're drilling most of our soybeans. Drilled soybeans are planted very close together. They have a very poor root system. I would rather see soybeans planted in 15-inch rows or spaced a little wider apart. They have a much healthier root system, and they can help to break up some of this soil compaction. Also, if you look at corn, it has a very thick root, and it tends to be limited by the plow layer. We saw that in Minnesota last year when we visited Minnesota. Their plow layer was down there about eight inches deep. That's where they plowed every year. Those roots could not get through them. Even though they had beautiful soils, they were only reaching about 125 to 140 bushel corn yield. They had some of the prettiest soils I've ever seen, dark, rich, black, but the soil was compacted, so that was limiting their yields. What percentage of the time do we have live roots? Typically in a corn-soybean rotation, only maybe four months out of the year and maybe as much as five months, about one-third of the time. If we can add a cover crop to that, we can greatly increase the amount of soil organic matter that we have in the soil. And one of the things that people have asked me is, why does no-till really have more live roots than conventional tillage? The answer is not really. It's not until you add the cover crop that we start to gain soil organic matter. So what's missing in no-till is those live roots. Soil compaction is a biological problem. It's related to a lack of living roots. Uh, in the soil. So I've got about 15 minutes left. Let's start looking at some things that we can do to get rid of this soil compaction. So if we're looking at subsoiling, here's some research that was done uh, in Ohio. Subsoiling yield gains or losses 
if you have conventional tillage with subsoiling, we found out that the corn yield gained about one to three bushel or about 3%, about a three percentage increase. On soybean yields, it was just a little bit more. We gained anywhere from two to five bushels or about a 10% yield increase. What happened when we had long-term no-till? It actually went the other way by the same amount. Our corn yield loss, we lost anywhere from one to three bushel or about 3%. Soybean yield losses were around 10%. So what does subsoiling do if we're comparing subsoiling versus cover crops? Uh, the subsoil, what does it do? It gives you immediate change in soil structure as down as deep as what you're going to subsoil it if you're going down eight inches deep. However, those changes are not permanent, and it actually leads to greater reliance on tillage in the future because we're losing that soil organic matter. It will increase infiltration in that top 18 inches because you're fluffing up the soil. It leaves the soil susceptible to compaction later. The first trip across that field, you're going to compact that soil. 80% of that soil will recompact almost immediately with the first trip. What can cover crops do? Well, the change is a little bit slower, but it's a little deeper. We can go three feet deep or even deeper with really deep-rooted cover crops. It uh, increases the infiltration, but it may take a little bit of time. Generally, cover crop roots can go through about one foot of, soil, of compacted soils per year. So if you have a very heavily compacted soil, it may take a little bit of a time. Think about your grain carts and your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, combines. A typical combine is going to compact that soil 18 inches deep, uh, about 26 tons uh, of uh, compaction for axle load, it'll compact it down to eight inches deep. One of the things that cover crops do is they protect the soil from erosion. They add nutrients and organic matter. They tie up the nutrients. They fit into a continuous no-till system. They really make the no-till work much better, and they help to protect against soil compaction. If you want to think about this, just imagine if you had two bricks and you put a sponge in between them. What happens is as you add organic matter, if you were to compress those bricks, that bricks would come back apart. The sponge helps to uh, alleviate some of that compaction. It doesn't allow those bricks to get too close together. So if you imagine these bricks, bricks are made out of clay. They have a negative charge. If we take these two bricks and we get rid of the organic matter, now you've put a positive ion in between there, something like uh, calcium or uh, potash. That's going to set that. Uh, those two bricks up and it's going to set up like a brick wall. That's what happens. I like to call it cement mix. That's what happens when we till the soil excessively. We need that organic matter in there to cushion the soil. Here's some of the soil resistance and here's the rankings. And we'll start from the bottom. I'm going to go back. Subsoiling, deep rip, full surface tillage. You're adding a lot of oxygen into that soil. It will help you, but it the problem is it's a short-term solution. We can moldboard plow or chisel plow, and then when we finally uh, we'll create a fine um, seed bed, but the problem is, again, the more you disturb the soil, the more organic matter you're losing, and, just, and so you're going to be dependent on that system year after year after year. We can subsoil with white space, uh, space shanks, and that will help, so we're not doing quite as much disturbance. We can get into strip till, where we only till up just a small portion of the field and then we leave the rest of the field untouched and that will help. We can do shallow tillage, things like the airway and the phoenix hair. A lot of people call this vertical tillage. The problem with this is now we've changed our compaction layer. We've seen this time and time again as we do the shallow tillage, your, your compaction layer rather than being eight to nine inches deep now may be only two, three, four inches deep. However far that you go down, the bottom of that tool creates a compacted zone. We can do intermittent, uh, intermittent no-till, which is tillage every other year. Typically in a corn-soybean rotation, they might till the soybeans and then go to corn because the corn has such a thick root, it really benefits from having well-aerated soils. Or we can start to go to continuous no-till, where we get light residue on the soil. Again, now we're building up that organic matter, we'll have less compaction. If we get more residue, that's better, with no cover crop, 
once we add the cover crop, now we're starting to cushion that soil. And then the best situation is where we have continuous no-till, cover crop, and controlled traffic. Now we're limiting uh, that zone that we're compacting to a very small portion of the field. And if we do that year after year, uh, now we can make uh, the, our soils much healthier and uh, have a lot less compaction. How to establish cover crops? Uh, add diversity to your soils. You can reduce your crop maturities. Basically on corn, we're looking at a shorter maturity. If you can reduce that by five to seven days, that will really help you. We can also grow soybeans, grow an earlier maturing soybean. One of the key points uh, is we need to give that cover crop time to uh, establish before winter sets in. Most cover crops need anywhere from 60 to 90 days of growth. And so one of the ways we can do that is we can intercede. We can either fly it on or broadcast it. A lot of our farmers uh, are now um, investing in these high boy applicators. They have a 90-foot boom on them, and they're using an air seeder with drop-down tubes that they'll go in between the corn, and they can seed cover crops uh, into their corn or even into their soybeans and get them started. And then when they harvest them, a lot of times these cover crops may be two, three inches tall, starting to grow. That gives them a head start going into winter. We can let that cover crop grow longer in the spring and interseed uh, our next crop into it. We like to do this with uh, soybeans. We'll use cereal rye. We'll let that cereal rye grow in the fall, let it grow in the spring. Uh, in Ohio, we have a problem with excess moisture, so if we let it grow it, uh, through respiration, it will allow a lot of that, uh, uh, through uh, transpiration, it will allow a lot of that water to uh, uh, get out of the soil by, by uh, putting it up into the atmosphere. So we can actually get onto our fields anywhere from seven to 10 days earlier. We'll actually let the cereal rye grow up, plant our soybeans into it, let the soybeans come up, then kill the cereal rye. If we kill the cereal rye too early, it'll lay down, and then if we uh, have some uh, wet weather, that soil will stay real sticky, and then it may not dry out till uh, late June or even July. So what we like to do is let it grow up, either drill or plant our soybeans or uh, into that cereal rye, it will not uh, hairpin as much, and it won't tend to bind uh, as much. And so it's much easier to do that. We can also use legumes, uh, things like uh, winter peas or uh, uh, crimson clover, and we'll plant those with oilseed radish and uh, do that before corn, and that's been very, very successful. We've seen as much as uh, six to eight bushel yield increases on our soybeans, and uh, with our corn, uh, uh, it varies quite a bit depending on how good your soil structure is, but we're seeing uh, 10, 15 bushels, sometimes even more uh, yield increases uh, uh, by uh, doing this practice. Here's some of the best cover crops to fight soil compaction. Grasses uh, have a very fibrous root system. I'm a real big fan of sorghum sedan grass. Uh, you can let your sorghum sedan grass grow a little bit. Uh, in Ohio, we tend to plant it after wheat. Our wheat, we have winter wheat, so our wheat will come off in July. We'll plant the sorghum sedan grass. If you can let that sorghum sedan grass get about three feet tall and either harvest it. In some cases, guys don't have livestock, so they'll just mow it off. When you mow sorghum sedan grass, you get anywhere from five to nine times more roots being grown. And so it really tillers out. And it's all about roots in the soil. That really helps to keep your soil, really gives good soil structure to your soil. Annual ryegrass is another really good one. It can be a little harder to manage. Cereal rye and oats can also be used. Uh, very fine roots. They can find those planes of weaknesses. They can really help you with soil compaction. They also go uh, fairly deep in the soil. Annual ryegrass will go five to six feet deep. Uh, unless there's a uh, water or limiting layer, cereal rye tends to go about 30 to 36 inches and in, uh, similar numbers for oats. We can also use the brassicas, things like the oilseed radish or the turnips. Oilseed radish, uh, especially the, uh, some of the uh, uh, daikon varieties such as uh, um, tillage radish or the groundhouse radish, they get a fairly good size uh, root system. They're white. They're very sweet. The earthworms absolutely love them and uh, they do a very good job in uh, loosening up soil. Matter of fact, if you're going to plant oilseed radish, never plant them by themselves. 
on a hill with a greater than a 3% slope. We've actually seen some of the uh, soil on these slopes start to move if you get a heavy rainfall. We like to uh, plant them with another grass or plant them with another legume uh, to get more roots and to uh, have more biomass there. For legumes, uh, you want a large root network. Hairy vetch, cow peas, red clover, and winter peas are some of the ones that we're using that gives you the relationship. If you've got a problem with surface compaction, buckwheat is excellent, and also phacelia. That's a new uh, one that came out of uh, France. Uh, they work quite well. Buckwheat is very beneficial for uh, uh, insects, and it also helps if you have low phosphorus. Uh, it has a lot of organic acids in it, so it will release phosphorus into the soil. So if we're looking at, uh, and I'm, I'm getting low on time, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I've got about six more slides. If you look at the new concept that we're looking at, we're calling it eco-farming or ecological farming. We're trying to keep uh, the soil covered with live plants year-round. Again, if you only have plants out there four months out of the year, you only have about a third as much fuel and energy going into that soil. The plants give energy to the microbes, and the microbes keep those nutrients recycling. It also improves your soil. If we can keep those year-round, we've got 100% of the fuel and energy going into that soil. Here's what happens under conventional tillage. You have a smaller microbial population. We've got this brown combine, rusty combine. You'll notice we have a lot of carbon dioxide going up into the atmosphere. Here where we have the eco-farming, we're not disturbing the soil. We have a much larger microbial population, and they're going to keep more nitrogen and phosphorus recycling in the soil. And here's the relationship. Every 1% organic matter can give you as much as $850 of nutrients that it's going to tie up per year. 1,000 pounds of nitrogen and roughly 100 pounds of phosphorus, potash, and sulfur, that adds up to about $850 for every 1% soil organic matter. How do we lose these? Well, when we do tillage, you'll see these whirlwinds there. That's the carbon dioxide going off. And you'll notice that we, do, we can't tie up as much of the uh, nitrogen and the phosphorus because we have less organic matter in the soil. Uh, anywhere from 50 to 75% of the phosphorus is tied up organically, and right around 90% of the nitrogen is tied up in an organic form. Here where we're doing the eco-farming, we're carrying those nutrients forward. These plants that are alive in the winter, even though the soil may be cold, uh, it's much warmer down below. Uh, it would be around 50 degrees there. They can, uh, below the frost line, they can actually take up nutrients all winter long, and they're uh, turning that into uh, soil or organic matter, something that will turn into. Here's what happens when uh, uh, we do too much tillage. Tillage to the soil more microbes is like the worst hurricane, the worst earthquake, worst forest fire, and the worst tornado all wrapped up into one event. It really disturbs them. They don't like to have uh, this disturbance. You'll have a much healthier microbial population if you uh, uh, stop doing the tillage. And where do we lose these nutrients? Most of them are lost in the winter. They're lost to the air and to the water because we don't have plant roots there to absorb them. So a lot of times in late winter, early spring with the snow uh, melt, a lot of these nutrients are lost. Here where we have the eco-farming, we're keeping those nutrients tied up and we're carrying them forward to the next crop. Finally, in summary, I think I might have, uh, might have a minute or two for uh, questions. Soil compaction is related to the biology of the soil and how the soil was managed. Organic matter and microbes influence soil compaction. If you have cold no-till soils, it's probably a result of soil compaction and poor soil structure. If you can add cover crops and no-till to that system, you'll actually uh, improve your, your soils, and they should be warm and moist. That's an ideal place to plant corn and soybeans. Active living roots and the microbes are acting and working together to improve your soil structure. That equals this ecological farming that we're really promoting, no-till plus cover crops. So I think I have maybe a minute to go. We may get cut off. Any questions? I did that pretty quick. That's about as fast as I've done that. So uh, if we get cut off, that's fine. All right. Well, sorry for some of the technical uh, problems we had and delays, but I uh, hope you guys enjoy your conference. Can somebody tell me about how many people we have there? Uh, right about 
230. Well, great. I wish I could be with you, but okay. I'll see if I can answer it. Hello? How do we get cover crops to grow all year? I, I, is that what you're talking about? Okay, one of, the, one of the benefits as you go a little further north is, especially cereal rye, it originated in uh, the mountains of China. Those roots are active all year round. Even though they may not be growing, snow actually protects a lot of our cover crops. You may have a, um, a much more beneficial growth to some of these cover crops. What's really detrimental to cover crops is the wind. And so if you can protect that, um, that the crown of these cover crops and keep some residue over there, even though it looks like they're not doing, you may not see a whole lot of top growth, they can do a lot of benefit from just the roots growing down through the soil. Cereal rye is a, a really good one uh, after corn, uh, probably in South Dakota. I mean, it grows uh, up into Canada, so that's probably one of your best ones. Other questions? Oh, well, good. Sure, we can do that. Okay. In a dry spring, yes, there can be. Um, and what you want to do is if you have a dry spring and you see that, it's, that you're going to go into a drought, you want to conserve moisture. Uh, what you want to do is you want to build your organic matter, but you don't want to hurt that next crop. So, and it's hard to predict this. But if you see that the soil is excessively dry and you're getting a lot of uh, transpiration going on, you can kill that cover crop early. You guys don't have as much problem. Here in Ohio, we have seven out of 10 years, it's wet. And so we're trying to dry out our soils. You probably need to manage your soils a little differently. You might want to kill that cover crop uh, uh, early and in order to conserve moisture and then plant into it uh, when the conditions are right. But uh, it should make the soil uh, much more mellow. Uh, that's at least what we've seen here in Ohio especially when we're using these oilseed radish, we used to worry about we'd have too big of a hole there. But you also find, and I didn't tell you this, cover crops will give you more moisture because you're going to trap more snow. Uh, we've seen this time and time again. If you put up, it's almost like a, uh, uh, a snow fence. It, it traps the snow on the soil so that it's not blowing across your fields, and you'll actually gain some uh, moisture by having a, a cover crop that's maybe a couple inches tall, it'll trap the, that snow there, and you'll gain uh, basically what you're losing. I, all the recent uh, information that's come out says that cover crops uh, are really adding uh, water to the soil. And, and even though we're losing some from transpiration, if we see that that's a problem, just kill them early. Thank you. Does that make sense? Thank you. Oh. Well, it, I'll tell you a quick one until we get cut off here, a story from Nebraska. We had some guys, this idea of fallow soils, that's the stupidest idea we ever come up. That's my personal opinion. I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, in Nebraska, some guys started doing no-till, long-term no-till with cover crops. They found out that they were, they were using two feet of irrigation per year. They reduced it down to six inches per year by going to no-till and cover crops. The reason being is they were trapping more snow and they were adding organic matter to their soil so now they could store more, uh, more water. Remember that, that chart that I give you was the inches of water per foot of soil. 
So if you can get these cover crops to go very deep into the soil and add a couple percentage points of organic matter to each foot of soil, you can greatly increase your water storage capacity. And then if you have that residue on the surface, you're not going to have as much heat. You're not going to have as much uh, evaporation going on. You're going to store a lot more water in your soil. Rain makes grain, but the, also uh, going along with that, uh, ex, more, uh, more water holding capacity in your soil is going to equal higher yields. Uh, I wish I could be with you folks, but uh, I've got another meeting <laughs> here in Ohio yet tonight that I have to do. So uh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.